You won't need your Bibles. If you've got a sheet, you won't need your Bibles. Okay, because I've got all the scriptures on this sheet. Tonight's going to be more of a Bible study. Okay? Sorry? Like Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen. <laughs> uh, um, tonight's going to be a, a pretty in-depth Bible study. We're going to go to a lot of Bible passages. I didn't want to waste time flicking through different passages. And I want you to see all these scriptures for yourself anyway, okay? But the title of the sermon, well, I was going to preach, first of all, I was going to preach, you know, sins that will get you kicked out of church, part four. That's going to have to wait another week. I really wanted to continue on to this theme of the resurrection. So we had Resurrection Sunday, you know. Uh, but what did Christ do? I mean, once he was resurrected, was that the end of it? What did he do for the next 40 days? Do you guys know? He just kept appearing to all his disciples. Okay? In his physical, resurrected, glorified body, he would appear to his disciples. And so when we look at John chapter 20, which was read, I'll just, uh, it's not there on the sheet, I think. But John chapter 20, verse 20, the Bible says, And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. When they saw the Lord, the title of the sermon tonight is, They Saw the Lord. They saw the Lord. And, and so Christ had many, many appearances to his disciples for the next 40 days. And then he was um, on the Mount of Olives. You guys know about the Mount of Olives when all his disciples came. And they, he gave the Great Commission, not for the first time, but for the last time. I think it's four times that he gave, gave the Great Commission. But for the last time, then he was, he was taken up in a cloud. You remember that? He was taken up in a cloud. And, and so, you know, he'll return. When he returns, he'll be coming back on a cloud as well. But these appearances of Christ are so very important. The resurrection is so important for our Christian faith. Okay? Because look at the first reference there. First reference in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. If Christ is not risen, then me preaching right now is vain. It's empty. It's waste. It's useless. Right? Being in church tonight is a waste of time if Christ was not resurrected from the dead. And your faith is also vain. Your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ is vain if the resurrection ever took place. Look at verse 15. Yea, and we have found false witnesses of God. You know, we, we, we laugh at the Jehovah Witnesses. We call them false witnesses of God. But if Christ was not resurrected, then we are false witnesses of God. And they don't believe Christ was resurrected from the dead. They don't believe He was resurrected boldly. I mean, sorry, bodily. They don't believe that. So what does that make them according to this passage? False witnesses of God. So that is the right term to use for these people. But then it says, Because we have testified of God that He have raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. Verse 16, But if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ, this is the most important part, right? This is the most scary part of it all. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Ye are yet in your sins if Christ was not raised. Which means you're going to have to face God on Judgment Day with your sins, unpaid for. And you're going to have to pay for your sins eternally in hell. So we see how important it is that Christ was resurrected from the dead. Which is why Christ spent the next 40 days showing himself to his disciples. And that's what we're going to be learning about tonight. Look at Romans 4.23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to, him it, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So again, it's just reinforcing that our justification before God is because Christ was risen from the dead. Okay? Now, why is this important? Why is it so important that Christ was risen? I'm giving you some reasons behind this, right? Our, our, this, is, this is a waste of time. My preach is a waste of time. You know, your faith is a waste of time. You're still in your sins. You might as well try to be keeping the law of God or something to go to heaven. You know, it's for our justification. But also look at verse John, John chapter 2, verse 19. Because if Christ was not resurrected from the dead, then Christ's um, testimony would be in vain. 
He, he would be found a liar. Jesus Christ would be found a liar. Because in John 2.19, he says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. This is Jesus speaking. He says, in three days, he will rise up this temple. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. So Christ promised that he would raise his body up after three days when it was taken down, when it would be destroyed, right? And if he was not resurrected from the dead, he'd be found a liar. This would not be someone I would want to put my faith on. This would not be someone that I would want to follow and believe on, right? So, I mean, just his, his testimony, you know, if he was not risen from the dead, would fall apart. But look at Acts chapter 1 verse 1. Okay, if you're following in your sheet, I've got it all laid out there for you guys. Acts chapter 1 verse 1. The former treatises have I made, O Theopolis, for all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that he was, um, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive, all right, to whom he showed himself alive, Alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. So what's the proof that we have of Christ's resurrection? That he showed himself to his disciples. That's the proofs. Okay? That he showed himself alive after his passion. That's after his crucifixion. Being seen of them 40 days. That's where the 40 days comes from. 40 days. What happened on the 50th day? Pentecost, right? So 10 days later, that's when the Holy Ghost came and empowered the believers. They preached, got many thousands of people saved. But the 40 days, he was showing himself to his disciples. He was getting them ready for the Great Commission. He was getting them ready to believe on him and to boldly stand for the, pr- for the truth because so many of them died preaching Jesus Christ. And if they're going to give their life for something, they better see Christ. They better see that it's true. It's the infallible proofs that Christ has given His disciples. It's the same for us. The reason why we believe in a risen living Savior is because we have these infallible proofs in the Scriptures for us today. Okay? 40 days, verse number 3, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them. Pay attention to that. Jesus Christ, when He showed Himself, assembled with them. This wasn't some spirit. This wasn't some hologram. This wasn't some pie-in-the-sky apparition. He assembled with them. He fellowshiped with them. He ate with them. He spoke with them. He hugged them. He held them. Okay? This was a bodily resurrection of Christ. Commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. So that's the day of Pentecost, ten days later. Alright, so we see why the resurrection is so vitally important to our faith. Now, 1 Corinthians 15. Look at down there. There's an order of of appearances of Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians 15. Okay? There's six appearances in this chapter. Okay? Now, what I want to uh, tell you, because one of the difficulties, okay, one of the challenges you're going to find in the Scriptures is trying to build a chronology of the appearances of Jesus Christ. It's challenging. It's not easy. Okay? And I have seen people try to use this as contradictions to the Scriptures. And so if these are our infallible proofs, then I want us as a church, I want every one of you, this is why I've given you the handout, to know exactly who Christ appeared to and in which order. It's not that difficult once you've worked it out. Okay? But it does require a lot of Scriptures... So that's why I don't want you to use your Bibles. We're just going to read off the, off the page today. And then when you go home, you can do further study if you want. Okay? But in 1 Corinthians 15, we get six appearances of Christ. Look, at, Let's start with verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which, ye are, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, notice verse 5. I've, I've highlighted and, and bolded these names for you. Okay? And that He was seen of Cephas. Who's Cephas? You guys remember? Peter. Simon Peter. Cephas. But notice 
what he's written here is a chronology. It's not just a random name of names of people that he appeared to. Because it says of Cephas, then of the twelve. Okay, so that's afterwards. And then look at that. After that, verse 6. After that, he was seen above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep, some have died. Um, and then after that, you see the chronology? After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And then he says this, And last of all, the end, the last one that saw him, risen. The last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. That's Paul. Paul the apostle says, Last of all, it was me that seen him as one born out of due time. Okay? So we need to make sure when we start to build this chronology, we need to make sure that 1 Corinthians 15 remains intact because we've got a good order there. Now, those are six appearances that Paul lists, but there were more than six appearances. Okay? So this is what we need to combine to put together. So turn your page over to page number two. Before we get into the appearances, the most challenging appearance to work out is the first appearance, believe it or not. Because it's straight after, um, we, we, we need to read about um, Resurrection Sunday. We need to read about the empty tomb and work out what's going on with the disciples. Okay, So it's the first one that I'm going to spend most time on. But then the other ones, once we've worked this out, the other ones will follow quite easily. Okay, so in the, on the early morning of Resurrection Sunday, on the early morning, let's, let's pick up John chapter 20, verse 1. Notice what it says this, what it says here. The first day of the week cometh who? Mary Magdalene, early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre. And by the way, I don't know if you've, I've mentioned this to you guys. You notice that sepulchre sounds like sepulveda? <laughs> That's because, you know, my, my surname does come from sepulchre. Like it's got the same root words. So if someone asks you, you know, who's your pastor? You can say, you know, it's pastor death. <laughs> you know, it's pastor grave. It's pastor tomb. You know, <laughs> that, that's where it comes from. Anyway, that's, that's something else. But it's Mary Magdalene. And when you, if you guys have seen, um, like, movies of Jesus, quite often they'll depict Mary Magdalene coming all by herself to see the empty tomb. And they take that from John chapter 20. But I just want to show you, like, tell you that that's, that's a lie. Right? Because when you put all the verse, all the scriptures together, you'll notice that Mary Magdalene did not come by herself. Now the question might be, well, why didn't John mention the others? Well, think about, think about our church tonight. Okay? Like if someone wrote down, let's say someone writes down, I saw Kevin come to church. Is that true? Yeah. But was it just Kevin that came to church? No. What if someone else wrote down, I saw Kevin come with Christina and the children? Is that contradictive of the person that said Kevin came to church? No, they're both true. Okay, just, just, someone's adding more detail, right? What if someone wrote down, I saw Callum and his family attend church, but they don't mention me or my family? Is that a contradiction? No. You know, you've got different writers just writing different parts of the same event, the same thing that took place. That's what you're going to find in the scriptures. You've got to be careful. Compare scriptures with scriptures, and it will give you a full picture of what took place. But John chapter 20 verse 1, we see there was Mary Magdalene that came early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and see if the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth. Now pay attention to this. Like, this sounds like it's, ha- like, it sounds like it's happened straight away. It kind of has, right? Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, who's Cephas, right? So she runs. She sees the empty tomb. I guess she panics and runs to Peter, specifically Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loves. Do you guys know who the disciple that Jesus loved is? John. Right? So John wrote this book. That's how he describes himself. The disciple that Jesus loves. Right? It's John. He's referring to himself. Came to, she went to Peter and John. And saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre. And we... Notice the we. Okay? So that's your first reference. It wasn't just her by herself. And we know not where they have laid him. Okay, now let's find out who else. Who's the we? Who was with Mary Magdalene? We learn about that in Luke 24, verse 1. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they, you see that? Plural. They came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. Whoa, there's others. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre, and they entered in, and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass... As they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. 
Now, what I believe has taken place here, I believe Mary Magdalene has already run off. Okay? Mary Magdalene has already run off to find Peter, and she's not seen these two angels. Okay? But the others that are with her are seeing these angels. But Luke 24 doesn't mention Mary running off. We get that from John. Okay? Now, let's, we can get some names. We can find out who these others were. Let's look at Matthew 28, verse 1. Matthew 28, verse 1. And in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene, yep, we know that, and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. So now, no, okay, we have another name. It's another Mary, right? Mary was a very common name in those days. So who's the other Mary? Well, Mark 16, verse 1 tells us, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, that's the second name, and Salome, that's the third name, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. Now, was it just these three ladies? No, let's look at Luke 23. Luke 23, verse 55. And the women also, which came with him from Galilee. So there was a bunch of other women that had followed Jesus Christ from Galilee. They were there as well followed after and beheld the sepulchre and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So that's prior to Luke 24. Luke 24 is up above there on the page. Because then it says they came to the sepulchre. Who? Those three names. You know, Mary, uh, Mary, mother of, uh, Mary Magdalene, the mother of James, Salome, and all these other ladies from Galilee. So it's a quite a large group when you think about it. It's not just Mary Magdalene on her own. And again, think of those movies you watched. It's always Mary Magdalene all by herself, right? Look, I don't, I'm not against those movies. I, I, well, I guess I am in some ways. I am against it in a way. But if you're going to watch those movies, at least understand what the Bible teaches first and then watch the movies. So then you know what the errors are. Otherwise, you end up watching these, these Bible movies and it's going to taint your pers- perspective of what truly happened in the Scriptures, okay? Now... Um, Look at Luke 24, verse 10. It gives us another name. Um, It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna. There's another name, Joanna. And Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. Now, let me just pause here for a minute. I've just given you a whole bunch of names. I just want to prove the point that it was many ladies. That's important to understand the appearances of Christ leading up uh, soon after this. But let me just say this about the book of Luke. And I was discussing this with Jason the other day. The book of Luke is not written in chronological order. Okay? It's not written in chronological order. Now, as an overall thing, yes, it's in chronological order. As an overall, yes, it starts with Christ being baptized and it ends with his crucifixion. Yes, as far as, you know, just a big picture, it's in chronological order. But Luke, if you read, if you read the first chapter, he says he's written things in a specific order so we can understand what took place. And the way Luke writes is very different to the other uh, gospel writers. The other ones that wrote the gospel wrote in very good chronological order. If you compare Matthew, Mark, and John, they're very very aligned chronologically. It's very excellent. So if you're ever going to build something chronologically, always use those three books first. And then use the book of Luke to supplement the gaps. Okay. Now the reason why the book of Luke is different is just the way he, he wrote it. So for example... Think about the soul winning Saturday, the, the service, the church service that we had on Saturday for the soul winning marathon. You know, we had, when we had the church, we had a song, then we had a Bible reading, then we had a song, then we had a, a, a sermon, then we had a song, then we had a sermon, then we had a song, then we had a sermon, then we had a song, okay, and then we finished in a word of prayer or whatever. But, so someone that's writing chronologically would, would say that, right? Song, Bible reading, song, sermon, like that. Luke writes differently. He writes like this. There were five songs, and then there were three sermons. Okay? It's not that it's not true. Yes, there were five songs and three sermons, but he doesn't write it in a way that's chronological. He, he's more thematic, he's more topical in the way he writes. So when he's trying to cover, like, you know, Jesus was preaching for a whole day, for example. He's preaching multiple things every day. Luke kind of grabs the same topics and puts them all together. Another really good example of this, if you look at Luke chapter 3, he talks about John the Baptist... But then you've got John the Baptist getting arrested and put in prison. And then the verse afterwards, he's baptizing Jesus. Like, what? What happened there? It's because, you know, Luke's got his order. He's got, he's got his way of writing things. 
Okay, so I just say that just as a rule of thumb. If you're ever trying to put things in chronological order, don't use Luke. Use the other ones and then use Luke to supplement the other material that you have. All right, all that just to, just to you know, help, help along with this study. Now, let's understand what took place. We have these women. They came to the sepulchre. They're shocked. The stones rolled away. The body's gone. Mary Magdalene runs away to, fight, to look for Peter and John. Okay? The other women stay. Now, let's follow, let's, follow, uh, let's follow Mary Magdalene. Let's follow her journey. She's going to run looking for John. Look at John chapter 20, verse 3. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, that one's being John, and came to the sepulchre, and they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stoop, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and see if the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. And as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away unto their own home. So Mary Magdalene gets Peter and John. They all come to the sepulchre. Now Peter and John sees it, and they're like, wow, it's, 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 it's empty. And then you see the disciples went away to their own home. Okay, they've left. Now, turn, turn the page over. Now we're going to get the first appearance of Jesus Christ. Who did Jesus Christ first appear to? It's there in, in, the, in the title. First appearance, Mary Magdalene. Because when Peter and John left, guess what? Mary Magdalene stayed behind. She was all by herself now. The other ladies had already left. Look at verse number 11. John chapter 20, verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulchre, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre and see if two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. So these are the same angels that, had, that the other women had seen, remember? But they've left the scene now. Now Mary Magdalene's seen these two angels. Verse 13, And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back, and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? I, mean, I don't know, is Jesus saying a joke here? I mean, she's looking for him. Anyway, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. That's all she had to say to her. Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say master. So she knew there that was Jesus Christ. Jesus saith unto her, touch me not. This is important, by the way. Just keep this in mind. We're not going to talk about this right now. Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend up unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Okay, so she's the first that Jesus appeared to. And was she allowed to touch Jesus? No, right? Jesus says, um, touch me not. Yeah, touch me not, because he had not yet ascended to the Father. We'll talk about that later on. Now, what's the second appearance? Matthew 28, verse 8. Matthew 28, verse 8. Okay, now we've got to get this chronology right, okay? Remember, there was a group of other women, right? Mary, the mother of James, and, and uh, Joanna, and Salome, and other women from Galilee. Verse 28, uh, Matthew 28, verse 8. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, okay? Because the angel said, you know, he's not here anymore. And did run to bring the disciples' word. So they went to the other disciples, Peter and John were somewhere else. That's where Mary Magdalene went. They're going to the other disciples, okay? They've taken different paths, which is why you don't see Peter and John meeting these ladies on their way back. Verse number 9. And as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. 
Now, are these ladies touching Jesus? Yes. It says there, and they came and held him by the feet. They, they stooped down, they touched his feet, and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into, Gal- that they go into Galilee, and there that shall they see me. This is important. Okay? Tell them to go into Galilee. Because that's where another appearance of Christ is going to take place. That's going to be the appearance where the multitude, where a great number of people see Jesus Christ. Just keep that in the back of your head. But you see now, these other ladies see Jesus on their way back to tell the disciples. But they're allowed to touch Jesus. Mary Magdalene was not allowed to touch him, yet they are allowed to touch Jesus. So something's taking place, right? Jesus said he had to ascend to the Father. We'll talk about that later. The third appearance. What's the third appearance? The third appearance is to Simon Peter, or Cephas. And we get that from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4. Now, what's interesting about this appearance, it's not recorded anywhere in the Gospels. We don't know anything about it except with what Paul wrote about it. Okay? Like, we don't, we don't see the meeting. We don't see what Jesus said to Simon Peter. We don't know how Peter reacted. We don't, know, we don't have a record of this except for Paul saying this took place in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4. And we know that that chapter is in chronological order. So the third appearance was to Simon Peter. And then it says here in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of Cephas. He was seen of Cephas. Okay. Let's turn the page to page number four. So first was Mary Magdalene. Second was the other group of women. Third was Simon Peter or Cephas. Who's the, what's the fourth appearance? The fourth appearance is to Cleopas and the other disciples. Jesus appeared to two men. Okay? If you know that story, where the two, well, here, let's have a look at it. Luke 24, verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called um, Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. So there's two disciples on a journey, okay, to Emmaus. And then verse 18. And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, so we know one of their names, Cleopas, answering, said unto him, answering to Jesus. Jesus has appeared to them at this point. And Jesus basically asked him, why are you guys so upset? Why are you so upset? What's going on? Cleopas answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in those days? Don't you know what happened about Jesus Christ, you know, crucifixion? Haven't you heard about that? Let's drop down to verse number 30. Jesus then, you know, they, they, they allowed Jesus to, to, um, to uh, fellowship with them, and then he goes into their house. And in their house, look at verse 30. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave it to them. So he does the Lord's Supper here with them. He breaks the bread, blesses it. Look at verse 31. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. <laughs> so as soon as they knew him, Jesus, all right, done. <laughs> and he disappears out of their sight. Verse 32. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us? While he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures, and they rose up that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them. So they go and find the apostles. But look at verse 34. Saying, the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. What's the third appearance, remember? Simon Peter, Cleopas. So we have confirmation here that Jesus must have told them that he had appeared to Simon before them. Because they knew about it, right? He, they mentioned it to the apostles that they had appeared to Simon. That's the, that's the third appearance. That's the confirmation that we have in scriptures. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. So the fourth appearance is to Cleopas and the other disciple. The, the two disciples on the way to Emmaus. So the fifth appearance... Now, by the way, all these appearances so far are all on Resurrection Sunday. They're all on the same day. Okay? From the morning, you know, Mary Magdalene, and then, through, and then this is toward the evening now. It's getting later during the day. And then we're going to continue the story because they go, these two disciples, they go to look for the apostles, the eleven. And then let's pick up the story from verse 33. Let's look at the fifth appearance of Christ. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them. So there wasn't just the eleven, there were others with them. But let's look at verse 36. And as they, as they thus spoke, spake, so as these two were telling the apostles about their appearance of Jesus, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them 
and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. So this is Christ's fifth appearance. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me. Touch me. So they can touch him, right? Handle me. And see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when, when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. Now look at verse 24. In John 20, 24, it talks about the same event. But it says, it gives us a bit more detail. It says, but Thomas, you guys know about doubting Thomas. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So Jesus appeared to his apostles. Now notice in the heading there, I've got fifth appearance. But notice I've got first appearance of the apostles as a group. Okay? Now that's important because we're going to get... Some people, we'll look at it later, I'll explain to you later. But some people say, hey, there's a contradiction in the Bible. No, there's not. This is the first appearance to the disciples, the, to the apostles as a group, minus, minus Thomas. Thomas wasn't there. Now, that's the last appearance on the same day of Resurrection Sunday. Five appearances of Jesus Christ all in one day. Okay? Now, turn the page over. Now, let's confirm... Going back to the first and second appearances, the first Mary Magdalene, the second the women uh, on their way back, let's make sure that we have this order correct, the first and the second. The reason we know the order is correct, because in John 20, 17, when Jesus speaks to Mary Magdalene, I'll just, I won't read it all, he says, touch me not. Right? Why, can't he, why could Mary Magdalene not touch him? For I am not yet ascended to my Father. He had to go to heaven. On the first day of his resurrection, he had to go to heaven. And then he says, But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Why did Christ have to go to heaven on the first day of the resurrection? Hebrews chapter 9 verse 11 tells us why. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 11. It's on your sheet. But Christ being come and a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. What's a tabernacle? Where they would do the sacrifices. Where they would sacrifice the animals. They would sprinkle the blood. And they would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat if it was that annual event. It says, but a more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. This was a tabernacle that was not made by man. A tabernacle made by God. That is to say, not of this building. It was nothing earthly. It was not... The earthly temple is not the earthly tabernacle. Verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place. So in heaven, there is a holy place. In heaven, there's a tabernacle, a perfect tabernacle made by God himself. And Jesus had to take his blood to the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So Jesus Christ takes his blood and on the mercy seat in heaven at the tabernacle, he sprinkles his blood as our great high priest onto that heavenly tabernacle as a demonstration not just of his shed blood on the earth, but of his shed blood in heaven. That his blood testifies our salvation. That his blood testifies the forgiveness of sins in heaven and in earth. That's what Christ had to do so he wasn't to be touched. He had to remain pure and undefiled and clean, okay? The same way when the Old Testament priests, they had all these ritual washings, they had to be clean, they had to be, you know, properly adorned to go into that Holy of Holies. Otherwise, God could have striked them dead, okay? Christ had to be careful and make sure that, you know, He went up to heaven in the same way, all those Old Testament pictures of Christ. So He goes up, so Mary can't touch Him. And then we see in Matthew 28, verse 9, this is soon afterwards. I guess it didn't take him that long because it all takes place in one day. I mean, Jesus did a lot on that day. right? He raises from the dead. He, he goes to heaven, sprinkles his blood. He makes five appearances to his disciples. And then Matthew 28, verse 9, as, as we already read, And as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail, and they came and held him by his feet. Okay, they would have held, they would have seen that those uh, nail prints in his feet. They held his feet and worshipped him. They loved him to see that resurrected Savior. Now, let's move on to the sixth appearance of Christ. This takes place eight days later. Okay, a whole week later. Okay, this takes place. 
Now notice what I've written under the sixth appearance. It says the second appearance to the apostles as a group. I hope this is interesting for you guys, you know, like putting all this stuff together. But it's the second appearance of the apostles as a group. We're going to go a lot quicker now, okay? John chapter 20, verse 26. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. So Thomas has finally come to church. He's finally made it, right? He's there with the other apostles. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believe in. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Okay, Thomas believed. There was no longer doubting Thomas at this point. That was the second appearance to the disciples, which was the sixth appearance overall to all his disciples. Now the seventh appearance. The seventh appearance to his disciples is the third appearance to the apostles as a group. Okay, the third appearance to the apostles as a group. Let's look at it. John 21 verse 1. This is when, the, when a bunch of them are out fishing. A lot of them are out fishing. Not preaching the gospel. They're not fishing for men. They're fishing for fish. Right? John chapter 21 verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. So we don't know how long afterwards, but we know it was somewhere within those 40 days. Okay? And then notice the names that are there. Then were together Simon Peter and Thomas Codidimus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. So you can see it's a group of the apostles. I don't know if it's all of them, you know, but anyway, it's a bunch of the, the apostles there. And verse 3, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. And they say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. They're not catching, catching any fish all night long. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. Then he said unto them, Cast a net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitudes of fishes. They catch this great amount of fish, right? Because Jesus said, Put it on the other side. Jesus Christ does a miracle. Therefore, the disciples whom the disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Right? Because it's a miracle. They knew that Jesus Christ has done this before. It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fish's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Cast himself. I don't know why Peter was naked. <laughs> I'd go fishing. If, if, if we ever go fishing and you start taking off your clothes, I'm, I'm, I'm out of there. <laughs> I don't know why, okay? Maybe, I don't know, who knows. But he was embarrassed, right? He was naked and he quickly puts on his coat and he casts himself into the sea so Jesus can't see him naked. Now, now in this same chapter, John 21 verse 14, notice this. The reason I've been saying to you, this is the third appearance to the apostles as a group. Because it says that in the scriptures, it says here. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Right? And this is this where people mock the Bible and, and say, ah, oh, the contradiction of the third time, it can't be the third time. There was Mary Magdalene, there was a group of women, there was the two, there was so many other. No, it's the third time that he appears to his apostles. Right? It's the third time that he appears to this eleven. Now, it wasn't always the eleven that were there, but it was, it was a, there was a great group of them. There was, there was a number of them. It's the third time that he appears to his apostles. You know, the Bible's just giving us confirmation that we have the chronology correct. That's what's going on. It's not a contradiction. So that's the seventh appearance. The seventh appearance is out fishing. The apostles out fishing. Go to your next page, page number six. The eighth appearance. The eighth appearance. Now remember, Jesus told the ladies, go to Galilee. Tell all the disciples to go to Galilee because I'm going to meet them. Okay? This is the eighth appearance. This is a great multitude on a mountain Galilee. Now Galilee was about 100 kilometers away from Jerusalem. And they didn't have cars. 100 kilometers isn't a big deal for us in a car, right? It takes us an hour, going 100 kilometers an hour, whatever. But they would try to travel by feet or, you know, whatever they had. So, you know, this was several days' journey for them to get to Galilee. This isn't something that took, that was, that was um, quick. The other thing is, Jesus gave time for the word to get around so all of his disciples in the regions could come and see him. Okay, this is a great multitude appearance. Now, let's look at Matthew 28, verse 16. 
Then the eleven disciples, so the apostles, went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. So not only did Jesus tell the ladies, but Jesus told his apostles, Hey, Galilee, that's the place to see me. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Now notice, I just, I've underlined the next words, but some doubted. Why? Because those are the others. Those, those are the others that have come to see Jesus Christ. These guys have already seen Christ multiple times. Right? So they're not doubting, but others, this is the first time. It's like, well, is this really Jesus? Verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, The Great Commission, guys, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, some people have mistaken these words as the great commission that he gives before he ascends into heaven. But when he ascended up to heaven, that was the Mount of Olives. That was in Jerusalem. This is in Galilee. This is 100 kilometers away from Jerusalem. So Jesus Christ gave the great commission multiple times. Okay? It wasn't just a one-off. This was a very important teaching that Christ had to leave his apostles and he says it to this great multitude that appeared how do we know that it's a great multitude 1st Corinthians chapter 15 verse 6 the chronology that Paul gives us he says after that he was seen of above 5,000 brethren that's a lot of people 5,000 brethren at once this was the mountain in Galilee of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are fallen asleep so now 5,000 Right? Um, these are the, uh, what, what was it? Sorry, page one. These are the uh, infallible, many infallible proofs, right? 5,000 all at once. That's the eighth appearance. We've got two more appearances to go. The ninth appearance was to James. And very similar to his personal appearances to Simon Peter, to Cephas, we don't have a record of James. Okay, we don't have a record except for 1 Corinthians 15. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, the first part, verse 7. After that, after the, the, the 5,000, he was seen of James. So that's the ninth appearance. Then the tenth appearance, the same verse says, then of all the apostles. So James and then all the apostles. The tenth appearance are all the apostles on the Mount of Olives. So back in Jerusalem. Okay, the Mount of Olives is near Jerusalem. This record is found in Acts chapter 1 verse 7. A great, again, the great commission being given, Acts 1 7. And he saith unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. There's a great commission again. But notice this, verse 9. And when he had thus spoken, sorry, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up with a cloud, received him out of their sight. So that's the last time. That's when, that's Christ. He goes to the Father. He's seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. That's the tenth appearance. Okay, on day number forty, when he goes up to heaven. But there's one more appearance. What did Paul say? Out of due time, as one born out of due time, turn the page over. The eleventh appearance was to the Apostle Paul, or to Saul. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8. And last of all, are there any more after this? No. If people say to you, I've seen Jesus, have they seen him? No way. Paul says, last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles, that am not meant to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Now, Acts chapter 9 records that appearance of Christ to Paul. Let's read it. Acts 9 verse 3. And as he journeyed, so as Paul, who was being called Saul at this time, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So who appeared to Paul here? It was Jesus, right? The Lord Jesus Christ. Now, was this just some spiritual vision? Or was it a physical, bodily appearance? 
Because all the other ones we've read were physical, right? Bodily appearances of Jesus Christ. Now, I say to you, it is a bodily uh, appearance of Christ. We'll see in a minute. Verse 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. But look at verse 7. And the men which journeyed with him, so other men who were journeying with Paul, stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So was it a physical apparition of Christ? Yeah, it was. They could hear Jesus talking. They could hear the voice. Right? Now, the reason I say that to you is because some people say, well, there was a talk appearance of Christ. And I've covered that just at the bottom of the sheet. And that talk appearance is to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. Now, Jesus did appear to John in the book of Revelation. But it's not a physical appearance to John. Because look at uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. John says, I was in the Spirit. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. That's Jesus speaking, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and so on and so forth. Okay? So yes, John did see Christ and heard Christ. But notice he was in the Spirit when he saw Christ. He did not see Him or hear Him physically in his, bodily, in his body. Okay? But Paul, yes, it was a physical apparition of Christ that even the travelers with him heard the voice of Christ. Now that's what I've got for you today. Now I want you to take your sheets and put them down, close them, put them down. Let's do a test. Let's do a test. Let's do a quiz. All right. If you've been paying attention, anyone can answer. Uh, ladies, men, anyone can say, okay? Because the teaching is over, so ladies, you're allowed to talk. Okay. What was the first appearance of Christ to his disciples? Anyone? Put your hand up if you know. Matthias? Mary Magdalene, yes. Second appearance of Christ to who? Brody? To the other ladies, correct. The third appearance of Christ? Yep. Simon Peter, perfect. The fourth appearance? Who remembers? Brody? Sorry? Not yet. We, we, we got one before that. One before going meeting the apostles of the group for the first time. Yes, Cindy? Yeah, before that. There's still one before that one. The two men, yeah. Uh, one of them being Cleopas. The two men, remember? On their way to... Um, Emmaus, yeah. So that was, a, that was the fourth appearance. We got one more appearance on the day of the resurrection. And Cindy? The group Yeah, the group without Thomas. The group, the apostles without Thomas. Excellent. Okay, then eight days later, there was another appearance of Christ. Who's got it? Any of you girls? Uh, Nicholas? To Thomas by himself? Oh, yeah, all the apostles with Thomas. Excellent. Then the seventh appearance. Who's got the seventh appearance? Come on, Callum. Brody? The third appearance of the group. What were they doing? They were fishing. Excellent. Um, the eighth appearance. Wait, let me see if I've got. I've kind of forgotten the eighth. Go, Cameron. To James. Is that right? <laughs> You're probably right. Let me just, let me just make sure. Oh, I'm forgetting now. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, no, there's one before James. There's one before James. Was that a hand? Yep. Yeah, 5,000. To the 5,000 brethren on the mountain of Galilee. Then, then, then James by himself. That's number nine. And then number ten. Which one's number ten? Callum? Stop looking at your sheet. <laughs> number ten. Come on, man. It's the easiest one. Well, maybe it's not the easiest one. Yeah? Not Paul. Well, that, that one's pretty easy. Before Paul, yeah? When he ascended up to heaven on the Mount of Olives. Yeah. That's number 10. And then number 11? Jason? Stephen. Stephen. Oh, yeah. That's a good one to count, eh? <laughs> Stephen. Well, it's not, in my, it's not in my notes, so that's wrong. <laughs> Another try, yeah? To Paul. Paul as one born out of due time. All right, excellent. You guys can take this home. Please study it out for yourself. And remember, guys, look. 
we're all together right now, right? We're one group at the church. If I wrote about today, and then, and we're all together, and then Matthew wrote about today, and then, you know, let's say Cameron wrote about today, let's, four, four people, and then Cal, Callum wrote about today, and wrote about, you know, who came into the church first, and who came in second, and who came in third. Do you think we're all going to be consistent and have the right answers? No way. And we're in a small group. I promise you, four of us wrote about who came in first. We're going to get that wrong. We're going to get it wrong for something so simple. And yet we have the scriptures. Doesn't this confirm the perfection of the scriptures? Doesn't this confirm that we have the perfect, pure word of God without contradiction? That even Paul can write about six appearances and have the chronology in order. We can look at all the other gospels and put it together and it's in perfect order. We can read about it being the third time that he appears to the apostles. And it's perfectly lined up. You know, that just shows you that this Bible is not authored by man, but authored by God. Right? We can, this confirms that this is the Word of God. This is why, you know, in Acts 1 verse 3, to whom he had showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. This is your proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Word of God and the fact that it's perfectly laid out for us. And if someone wants to debate that, hey, you now have your sheets. Go and study this. I want you to know this. Because the resurrection of Christ is more important than the doctrine of reprobates. Okay, It's more important than the doctrine of... Name one. <laughs> of creation. Okay, and now, All that's important. All doctrine is important. But the re- the, we saw how important the resurrection of Christ is. Otherwise, our faith is in vain and we are yet in our sins. And yet we know we're not because the Word of God is perfect and preserved. Let's pray.